February 21st, 2005, Miami, Florida. A utility worker had been dispatched to a vacant cul-de-sac on the outskirts of the city that morning to undergo routine work. Though that morning, the utility worker spotted something in the weeds a few feet from the street that would spawn an investigation of twists, turns, and mystery. A woman, beaten yet still alive, lay unconscious in the grass. And when she awoke, she had no memory of what had happened to her. Detectives quickly learned that she had been staying at the Airport Regency Hotel. But how had she disappeared from her hotel room, unseen by security cameras? And who would hurt her in this way? This was one of those cases that just sort of grabs you by the throat. It's just a complete mystery. She was dumped out and left for dead. Join me as we venture down the trail the private investigator followed that led him to other states, more crimes, and a man that nobody expected. I said, hell of high water. I know I'm right. I can feel it. I knew this was the guy. I was going to catch this guy. People say Ted Bundy didn't show any emotion. I showed emotion. The following episode is not suitable for those under the age of 13. Viewer discretion and parental guidance is advised. Before we delve into today's case, I'd just like to thank today's sponsor, June's Journey. June's Journey is a hidden object mystery game featuring a riveting story that will guide you through the twists and turns of the adventures of June Parker as she tries to solve the murder of her sister. While you investigate the case, you'll enjoy puzzles and characters that take you back to the glitz and glamour of the 1920s. You'll help June use her wits to escape tricky situations and get to the bottom of this thrilling murder story. The puzzles and clues that you'll find along the way are unique and clever, ensuring that you'll always be on the edge of your seat. I personally have found the game design to be absolutely beautiful within the game, with puzzles and characters being colourful and having this art style that I really, really love. I've worked with June's Journey before, and honestly, when I say that it's one of the best ways to wind down, it genuinely is. At the end of a long day, picking up my phone and playing June's Journey, it's kind of like meditation for me. It's brands like June's Journey that makes content like this video possible, so please don't hesitate to give them your support. Use the link down in the description and grab June's Journey for free and experience the excitement of June's story for yourself. Again, the link is down below. It's absolutely free and I'm, I love it, so make sure you play it. Anyway, uh, back to the case. It must be noted that the book and article on this case, written by Mark Bowden, have been pivotal in my research. I've left links in my sources down below if you wanted to check them out. It also must be noted that we will not be using the real name of the primary victim in this case out of privacy, and so we shall be using the name Lisa when referring to her, and any audio clips will also have um, distortion on them so her voice isn't recognisable. On the morning of Monday the 21st of February 2005, the emergency services received a phone call from a local power company worker who had been driving past the empty lots of an unbuilt cul-de-sac. The utility worker had noticed a naked woman face down in the weeds and told the police that she appeared to have been dead. The authorities flocked to the scene alongside medical professionals who quickly realised that she was, against the expectations of many, still very much alive. Subsequently, the woman was a lifted by the police to Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami and it had been there that she finally regained consciousness. The woman's right eye socket had been shattered and she had suffered severe trauma to her head. A rape test kit was deployed to establish whether sexual assault had taken place and unfortunately it had. Now due to the severity of her injuries, the woman was unable to speak, though she motioned to the police and nurses to get her a pen and paper and on that paper she wrote down her name. Now, as I mentioned previously, we will be using a different name for identity protection and privacy purposes. So on this paper, she did write her actual name, but we shall be calling her Lisa. Lisa not only wrote down her name, but also the contact information for her lawyer. Now, this immediately stood out to the detectives as being a little bit strange. 
strange, leading the detectives and investigators to question what exactly Lisa had been involved in. Gritting through the pain, Lisa tried to vocally communicate with the detectives, though they couldn't really understand anything she had been saying due to her Ukrainian accent and incorrect English. Despite this, the authorities quickly learned that Lisa had been living at the airport Regency Hotel for several months. The hotel had been located eight miles from where she was found and was just your standard airport hotel. As it turned out, Lisa had been working for a cruise ship company and had experienced an accident at work in which she had severely cut her finger on the job. And it was as a result of this that she had been put up in the airport Regency Hotel by her employers in order to recover from the injury. Now, some sources detail that Lisa had actually filed a lawsuit against the cruise ship company for this accident, but other sources don't really mention it, so I just thought that would be interesting to note. Now, the investigators inquired as to why she'd been so quick to provide the contact details of her attorney, to which Lisa explained that she didn't know anybody else and that her attorney had been the only person she knew who could help her. I didn't know no. I was alone up here. So the, first, the only one person who I knew, that was my attorney. The Miami-Dade detectives then asked Lisa about what she remembered. Who had attacked her? Where had she been attacked? Lisa told them that the assault, as far as she could remember, had begun in her hotel room on the fourth floor of the airport Regency Hotel. She claims her attackers to have been two or three white men who spoke with accents she described as being Hispanic, but that she hadn't been 100% certain. Lisa recalled one of the men using a pillow to muffle her screams, and that she'd been made to drink a strong drink, which she described to have been alcoholic. Her memories following being made to drink that strong drink were very hazy. Lisa described how she felt she had been carried, that she remembered being thrown over a man's shoulder, that she was brutally violated in the back seat of a car, and she pleaded for her life, but she didn't really remember much more. Interestingly, not long after the attack, Lisa and her lawyers filed a lawsuit against the airport Regency Hotel she had been staying in with allegations of negligence. This stuck out to the detectives. Was this a money grab? Was it part of a con? Whatever the case, the investigators did come through her hotel room for evidence. They interviewed employees of the hotel and obtained the CCTV surveillance footage from all of the hotel's CCTV cameras on the morning of the crime. A detective by the name of Alan Foote had been handling the case, and he did everything he could with the limited resources he had. The airport Regency Hotel had 174 rooms for guests and hundreds of people coming and going. Interviewing all of them would have been a task spanning months, and that was something tragically outside the realms of possibility, with the police department's already stretched thin resources. Several weeks had passed since the attack, and Detective Alan Foote and his team were no closer to finding the person or people responsible. And with the case going to civil court due to the law suit filed by Lisa and her attorney, the airport Regency Hotel decided to hire a private detective by the name of Ken Brennan to defend itself from the lawsuit and to get to the bottom of what had actually happened. As you can imagine, this didn't go down well with the detective Alan Foote, as it was usually very difficult to have a private detective investigating one of the cases you're working on. And Ken Brennan was a private detective that had the experience and determination to uncover the truth. Ken Brennan had been a police officer on Long Island. He had worked worked for eight years for the Drug Enforcement Administration before leaving and setting up his own business and becoming a private detective. He was also a, like, a, a mortgage broker at some point, but that's besides the point. He told the executives at the airport Regency Hotel who had hired him about his fixed policy, quote, I'll find out what happened. I'm not going to shade things to assist your client but I will find out what the truth is. According to Mark Bowden's article in Vanity Fair, Ken Brennan liked it when the information that he uncovered helped his clients, but that hadn't been his priority. Winning lawsuits wasn't the goal. What excited him most was the mystery, and this case had been perfect for him. Who had raped and beat a young woman and left her for dead in the weeds? Where had it happened? Was she being involved in a con? Was she part of a syndicate? Ken Brennan raced to find the answers. He introduced himself to the detective Alan Foote and explained his position. And surprisingly, detective Alan Foote shared the case file with the private detective. By the time that Ken Brennan had the case files in front of him, eight months had passed since the attack. He scoured over the crime scene photographs, CCTV surveillance footage, Lisa's victim statement, and the notes from interviews with several of the hotel staff members who hadn't seen anything unusual. Lisa's victim's statement 
and immediately stuck out to Ken Brennan. It was all over the place. She clearly had a very scrambled memory about what had happened to her. She claimed to have been attacked by one man, then changed to three, then changed to two. Lisa also stated that their accent or accents might not have been Hispanic, but rather Romanian. Within the entire case file, there had been nothing that pointed to the person or people responsible. And so Ken Brennan turned his attention to the hotel itself. He knew it had a substantial security system installed. The grounds of the hotel were fenced, the back gates locked and monitored. There had been just a handful of ways to gain access to and leave the building, all of which was covered by CCTV surveillance cameras. At night, the back door to the hotel was locked and could only be opened remotely. There were always two security guards on duty at any given time. All of the guests had NFC room key cards, which they used to unlock their rooms and to use the lifts. These key cards were also logged whenever they were used with timestamps on a central computer. This ultimately meant that it was possible to track the movements of every guest within the hotel. Ken Brennan decided to start with the facts. Lisa had gone up to her room on the fourth floor of the hotel at 3.41 a.m. This is backed up by her key card logs, which showed that she had used her key card to enter her hotel room at around the same time. The next fact Ken Brennan knew was that she was found at dawn in an empty lot eight miles west of the hotel. So what happened in that three hour window? She had to have left the hotel somehow, but this was where he was stumped. None of the CCTV surveillance cameras that covered the hotel showed Lisa leaving at all. It was as if she somehow teleported from her hotel room, and it's not as if Lisa could easily be missed on the footage. On the night of the attack, she'd been wearing a red puffer jacket, and combined with her long blonde hair, she stood out on the CCTV footage. Ken Brennan watched as Lisa left that evening to go out to dinner with a friend, returning at around midnight. I left in the hotel, I went outside with my friend for dinner. I had fun. Uh, we stayed there a while, had some drinks. Lisa was next seen leaving the elevator at about 3 o'clock in the morning. Ken Brennan followed her movements from the elevator cameras to the lobby as she left the hotel. Lisa had explained that she had walked over to a nearby gas station to buy a phone top-up credit card kind of thing, as she had wanted to call her mother, who had been back in Ukraine, and in the small hours of the morning in Miami, it had been around the same time that the Ukrainians had been waking up. She was then seen just minutes later returning back into the hotel lobby, crossing the lobby and entering the elevator to go back to her hotel room. This was the last time she was seen before being found a couple of hours later. Ken Brennan noticed a large man also getting onto the elevator right behind her. The two exchanged a handful of words before boarding the elevator. Now, it's important to note that according to the original police reports, Lisa re-entered her hotel room 20 minutes after boarding the elevator this time. This fact led the police to speculate as to what she'd been doing during that time. Some speculated her to have been doing sex work, and Lisa couldn't account for those 20 minutes. Ken Brennan took a closer look at the clock on the elevator's CCTV camera and realized that it actually ran 20 minutes behind the main computer clock, the main computer being where the logs of the keycard swipes were stored. This meant that she had gone straight to her hotel room from the elevator, and following that, she was not seen again by any of the cameras in the hotel, all of which were in working order without malfunction. Though it must be noted that these cameras weren't continuously recording, they were motion activated. And I know what you're thinking, what if you move slowly enough to, to trick the motion activated cameras into not recording? What if they weren't sensitive? What if they didn't come on? You know, what if the motion sensor failed? And the police thought that too. They decided to test this by trying to sneak slowly past the cameras to avoid setting off the motion detectors. But no matter how slowly they moved or from what angle they came from, the cameras would consistently detect their movement, click on and start recording. One theory that had been explored by the police had been that she somehow left out of her fourth story hotel room window. This suggested that she might have been dropped out of the window or lowered down from the window using rope or something like that, but the evidence failed to support this theory. Lisa had sustained no injuries consistent with a fall. She showed no signs of being tied with ropes and lowered. The police investigated the bushes outside the hotel to see if there'd been a disturbance or if there was any blood or anything like that, but 
they found nothing. Ken Brennan quickly ruled out this theory. Lisa couldn't have left the hotel via any other means than by the elevator and out the front door. The truth of what had happened was hiding in plain sight in the CCTV footage. Ken Brennan just had to figure out where it was hiding. He wrecked his mind. He was thinking, how would I get myself out of a hotel without being detected? And he came to the conclusion that there was only one way that she could have left without detection, and that must have been due to her being in some form of a disguise. Ken Brennan dedicated himself to cross-referencing the CCTV footage, room key card records, and guest lists to account for every single person seen on the footage. Slowly, the list of potential suspects was narrowed down. He kept an eye on people leaving with bags, he kept an eye on families coming and going, anyone, regardless of who they were, could be a suspect. This painstaking mammoth task eventually left Ken Brennan with one final suspect. The man who was seen entering the elevator with Lisa at 3.41 a.m. in the morning. This man was very big, at least six foot four tall and upwards of 300 pounds. The footage showed the man talking with Lisa as they get on the elevator, and then less than two hours later at 5.28 a.m., this same man is seen getting off the elevator into the lobby with a wheeled suitcase. The lobby camera followed him as he walked through the lobby and to the parking lot. Less than an hour later, the man is captured again, returning to the hotel, walking through the lobby to the elevator. Though in this instance, the man doesn't have the suitcase he'd been seen leaving with anymore. So why did this man wheel his luggage out of the hotel in the early hours when he hadn't been checking out, only to return an hour later without it? Using the doorways in the hotel as a reference, Ken Brennan managed to estimate the size of the bag to have been larger than it appeared in the footage. He actually invited a friend of his, who was a young woman that was a similar build and height as uh, Lisa, to try and get in a suitcase that he had bought that was the same dimensions as the one in the footage. And this woman fit inside the bag easily. At one point in the footage, the man appeared to tug at the suitcase as it had become stuck on something. That was when Ken Brennan realized that the bag must have been heavy enough to warrant such a tug and heavy enough to get stuck. Ken Brennan was convinced. Lisa had been removed from the hotel inside the suitcase the man had wheeled out in the early hours of that morning. There were only a few issues with this though. Lisa had told the authorities that she had been attacked by multiple men, that they had been white and that they had spoken with accents that sounded to her to have been Hispanic or Romanian. Ken Brennan speculated that the head injuries she had sustained and the language barrier may have accounted for those inconsistencies. But there had been something more. Something deep in Ken Brennan's gut was screaming that he'd been missing something. And then it clicked. This man had been cool, calm, and collected. He calmly entered the elevator. He calmly wheeled the suitcase across the lobby. He seemed completely unfazed. And to Ken Brennan, with all of his experience, this man was good at what he had done. This man had done it before. Ken Brennan took his findings to the hotel who had employed him to carry out this investigation. This is how he described that conversation with the hotel. In fact, one of the owners said, what the hell kind of an investigator are you? He goes, you're telling me it's this big black guy. Everybody else says it's too white Hispanic. You know, where is this coming from? And they all started laughing. And that's what really pissed me off. And I said, hell a high war, and I'm going to find out. I'm going to prove to these people that I'm right. I knew this was the guy, and I was going to catch this guy. Ultimately, the hotel gave Ken Brennan permission to keep working on the case, and so he looked again at the hotel records to try to put a name to this suspect. Though, the hotel records were a lost cause. There were hundreds of rooms, hundreds of guests, and obviously no physical description of each guest on the check-in form. The man might not even have been a registered hotel guest or visitor. The staff at the hotel didn't photocopy the passports of every guest, and even with the scans that they did, the photos in them had been muddy, and it was impossible to determine characteristics from them. And so he went back to the CCTV footage. Now that he knew who he was looking for, he painstakingly analysed every frame of every camera in the days surrounding the attack. In one piece of footage from the elevator cameras, the man was seen walking with another man who had been wearing a white t-shirt with the word Mercury across the front. Now this didn't mean much to Ken Brennan. It could be to do with a car company or the planet Mercury or anything, nothing solid that he could work with. He analysed how the two men interacted and quickly determined them to have been friends. Ken Brennan followed the two men as they walked to the hotel's restaurants. On the restaurant's CCTV footage, the man in the Mercury t-shirt was seen from behind for just a few frames, and on the back of his shirt had been another word. 
Ken Brennan could only make out the letter V at the beginning of the word and an O at the end of it. He took a guess at what the word could be and entered Verado into Google. And that's when a major break in the case hit. As it turned out, Verado had been the name of a new outboard engine that was being manufactured by Mercury Marine, who was a boat engine manufacturer. And at the time of the attack, there had been a big boat show taking place in Miami. It wasn't too difficult to theorize that the man in the t-shirt might have worked at the boat show for Mercury Marine. According to Wikipedia, Mercury Marine is a marine engine division of Brunswick Corporation, headquartered in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Ken Brennan decided to call up the head of security for the Brunswick Corporation, and that was a man by the name of Alan Sperling. Ken Brennan explained what had been going on and asked Alan Sperling whether he could help. His first port of call had been that the company could have put up the employees working the boat show at the airport regency, and Alan Sperling checked his records, and as it turned out, the employees had stayed at a different hotel. Ken Brennan then asked him whether any of the crew members that had set up the Booth uh, had stayed at the airport Regency Hotel, and this too was met with a resounding no. So how had this man got a t-shirt with the company's info on it? Ken Brennan asked Alan Sperling to find out who exactly got those t-shirts at the boat show, and two weeks later, Alan Sperling finally got back to him. He told him that the t-shirts had been given away at the boat show's food courts. Ken Brennan immediately checked who had been in charge of the food for the show, and he learned that it was a company called Centerplate who had been responsible. Centerplate was a food and beverage corporation serving entertainment venues in North America and the UK, according to its Wikipedia page, and it employs some 30,000 people. And so Ken Brennan decided to phone up the head of HR for Centerplate to see if they had put up any of their employees in the airport Richardson Hotel who were working the boat show. And as it turned out, they had put some of their employees at the hotel, though the company had hired over 200 people for the boat show from all over the place. Ken Brennan asked whether they could ask their workers if they remember seeing a, quote, big black man with glasses. A week later, Ken Brennan received a call back from HR at Centerplate, and they told him that some employees did remember seeing the man described. However, nobody knew his name. Someone had recalls that the man had originally been hired to work at Zephyr Field, which is where the minor league baseball team are based, the New Orleans Zephyrs, now known as the New Orleans Baby Cakes. So Ken Brennan had a potential location of the suspect. The only problem was that Hurricane Katrina had just destroyed and devastated the city just months earlier, so everybody had been evacuated. Ken Brennan brought all that he had found to the detective Alan Foote, but Alan Foote was sceptical, and the police didn't have the resources to investigate a lead based on a hunch. It was all very circumstantial at this point. Fortunately, though, Ken Brennan had a contact at the local police force in the area in New Orleans, someone who had actually helped him do a prisoner for and somebody who owed him a favour. The captain at the New Orleans police force dispatched a sergeant to Zephyr Field to find out more. Ken Brennan received a phone call from the captain shortly thereafter and he told Ken that he had a name, Mike Jones. Ken Brennan checked the hotel records and confirmed that a man by the name of Mike Jones had been a guest at the hotel when the attack had taken place. He had checked in seven days before the attack and had left one day afterwards. And on the check-in information, Mike Jones's full name was listed with his visa card, Michael Lee Jones. Ken ran the visa card and it turned out the card had been cancelled and the registered address had been for a property that he hadn't lived in for years. The phone number on the check-in form had been a number for Centerplate, the food hospitality company. It seemed as if Ken was on the brink of breaking the case. He just needed to find out where Michael Lee Jones was. He knew that Michael didn't work for Centerplate anymore, and so he began to list the company's competitors to see if he had gone to work for one of them. Ken started making his way down the list he'd made, calling the HR department of each and crossing them out when they confirmed Michael hadn't worked for them. One name stuck out on the list, a company by the name of Ovations. Ovations had its headquarters in the Tampa area, and so Ken Brennan decided to drop him. He managed to get an audience with the CEO of the company, and so Ken explained to him the whole situation before asking him whether they employed someone matching Michael Lee Jones's description. The CEO he spoke to didn't even check his records. He didn't hesitate. He straight away told Ken that if he wanted that information, then he would need to return with a subpoena. This was suspicious to Ken Brennan. Every other company had checked their records and told him no, so why was the CEO being so difficult? Ken got the fax number for Ovations and straight away called up Detective Alan Foote, who had been the lead detective on the case back in Miami Day. And it wasn't long before the CEO of Ovations was receiving a fax from the police in Miami Dade containing a very, very long subpoena. 
Ovations revealed that they had, in fact, an employee by the name of Michael Lee Jones who fit the description given, and this Michael Lee Jones had been working in Frederick, Maryland. Ken Brennan relayed what he had learned to the detective Alan Foote, the lead detective on the case, and he had been somewhat impressed by what Ken Brennan had uncovered, though he did remain quite sceptical. The police viewed Ken's findings as being a long shot, but they couldn't deny the fact that the name and location of a potential suspect had landed on their desks and that it had been the first lead in the case for months. And so Detective Alan Foote decided to go and check it out. The detective actually rang Michael Lee Jones in the morning of the day that he'd planned to pay him a visit to question whether he'd be available for a chat. He explained that he was just investigating an incident from Miami that had occurred during the boat show and confirmed with Michael Lee Jones that he had worked there, being careful not to give too much away. Notably, Michael Lee Jones had been very polite on this phone call, telling the detective that he had been in Miami at the time in question and that he would be available to meet before providing directions to where he worked. And so, later that day, Detective Foote and one of his partners walked up to Michael Lee Jones, who had been standing behind a barbecue counter at Harry Grove Stadium. Detective Foote would later describe Michael E. Jones as being a massive man. The size of Michael E. Jones had been intimidating to the detective, but the way in which he presented himself and the way in which he spoke had been soft and gentle. Michael E. Jones had been in charge of the food counter and appeared to have been well liked by his employees. The detective, his partner and Michael E. Jones moved away from the barbecue counter to a picnic area outside of the stadium so that they could talk privately. Detective Foote asked Michael E. Jones about whether he had met any woman when he had been in Miami, to which Michael told them that he had hooked up once with someone. When asked to describe her, Michael told them, quote, I only have sex with white women. The investigators continued their line of questioning, asking Michael whether he had engaged in sexual intercourse with anyone at the airport Regency Hotel, to which Michael told them no. He explained that the women he had sex with had been working at the boat show and that they had hooked up elsewhere. Michael went on to state that the woman had been German. Now, interestingly, Michael came across the detectives like he had nothing to hide. He was very, very confident. And Detective Foote was quickly feeling that his trip to talk to Michael had actually just been a massive waste of time, so he decided to cut to the chase. Detective Foote informs Michael that they were investigating the rape of a woman that occurred the week of the boat show, and he asked Michael whether he had been involved. Now, Michael was shocked by this accusation and he quickly denied it. Detective Foote then asked him whether he'd be willing to give a DNA specimen to which Michael agreed to do so, which in the eyes of Detective Foote, why would someone that is guilty willingly give over this DNA sample? And so the police sent off Michael's DNA sample for testing, and it would be months before they got any results. And when they did, Ken Brennan received a call from Detective Foote. Quote, you ain't gonna believe this. What? You were right. Michael Lee Jones's DNA had come back as a match for the DNA sample taken from Lisa's body following the rape. 11 months after the attack, Ken Brennan flew up to Frederick to meet with Detective Foote, who subsequently arrested Michael Lee Jones. Michael Lee Jones was formally charged with felonies pertaining to the rape, kidnap, and severe beating of Lisa. In the interrogation room, Michael Lee Jones insisted that he would never do such a thing to a woman. He told the police that he never had any problems paying women for sex and that he didn't get a kick out of hurting women. When asked to explain how his DNA ended up in the body of Lisa, Michael Lee Jones explains that he had engaged in sex with her, but he insisted that she had been a sex worker and that he had paid her $100. The detectives then asked him why he had rolled his suitcase out to the parking lot at 5 in the morning, two days before he'd actually be checking out from the hotel. Michael Lee Jones explains, quotes, I couldn't remember if we were leaving that day or the next day. I wasn't sure. They asked Michael what had been in the suitcase, and he told them that it only contained his clothes, shoes, and a video game, but that was when Michael tripped up. The detectives brought up the footage of Michael needing to give the suitcase an extra tug after it got stuck, and suddenly, out of the air, Michael remembered that he had packed a large number of books, due to the fact that he had been an avid reader. Though, when asked to name some of the books he'd read, Michael couldn't. He was unable to name a single title or author. Now, it must be noted that even with this DNA evidence, the case against Michael Lee Jones had been weak. There was justification for why he hadn't told the detectives before that he had slept with Lisa. He had a previous arrest for soliciting a sex worker, and if he had engaged in consensual sexual intercourse with Lisa, that would explain the DNA found. Lisa denied being a sex worker, but Michael 
said that she was a sex worker. It was ultimately Michael's word against Lisa's, and sadly, Lisa was not a reliable witness. Her memory of what had happened constantly changed, and even though she had picked Michael Lee Jones out of a photo lineup, she had seen his face before, and it wasn't substantial enough for prosecution. Michael Lee Jones was essentially arguing that he had had sex with Lisa and she had been unhappy with the pay or something to that effect and had decided to, uh, to accuse him of rape and had set up the entire thing. And as there was no one else involved and there was no other evidence, the whole case wasn't substantial enough for prosecution. Though, the prosecutors did end up striking a deal with Michael Lee Jones, in which Michael pleaded guilty to sexual battery with a weapon and aggravated battery in return for having the more severe charges dropped, like kidnap. And as a result, Michael Lee Jones was sentenced to a whole two years in imprisonment. Two years. But that's not where this case ends. No, not at all. You see, Ken Brennan had been convinced that Michael Lee Jones had done this before, and he speculated that once the police entered Michael Lee Jones' DNA into the CODIS database, they would find something more damning. Michael Lee Jones' DNA was entered into the CODIS database in late 2006, and several months later, which is basically how long it takes for the FBI to verify their matches and stuff, they had results. Three hits for DNA matches returned. A blonde-haired, blue-eyed woman, known as Victim 1, had been picked up in the early morning of the 1st of December 2005 by a stranger that matched Michael Lee Jones' description in Colorado Springs, and he had offered the woman a ride. Michael had then talked his way into her apartment before raping her. The detective on that case had no leads, and it had tragically sat unsolved for two years before the DNA collected from the victim had matched with Michael Lee Jones. The two other matches, the two other victims, had been both in New Orleans. In the early hours of the 5th of May 2003, a blonde woman, after a night's partying, went in search of a taxi to get back to her hotel, and she was known as Victim 2. It had been then that a man matching Michael Lee Jones' description had pulled over his car and offered her a ride. Now, Victim 2 would later testify that Michael had driven her to a disused parking lot and raped her, using his size and strength against her. Victim 2 had actually bitten into his palm so hard that she still had his skin cells in her teeth after the attack. She had reported what had happened to the New Orleans police, who took DNA samples from her. Victim 2's case, as with Victim 1 though, went cold until the CODIS match with Michael Lee Jones' DNA. Victim 3's case was all too similar to the other two, though interestingly, she had been unable to pick Michael's face out of a photo lineup. However, it had been multiple years since such a traumatic event had occurred to Victim 3 that it isn't surprising that her memory failed her, in my opinion, but the police really and the defence really seemed to make a big deal out of the fact that she'd been unable to positively ID Michael in the photo lineup, despite the literal DNA evidence. When the detectives checked where Michael E. Jones had been on the dates of the three victims' cases, it turned out he had been in Colorado Springs and New Orleans when they had happened. And so in 2008, as Michael's two-year sentence was coming to an end for the rape, kidnap, and attack on Lisa, again, he only got two years for that, Michael Lee Jones was flown to Colorado Springs to stand trial in the case of Victim 1. Now, tragically, Victim 1 had passed away while she had been awaiting justice for reasons unrelated to this case, natural causes. And this meant that the prosecution had to put forward a case based on two of the other rapes. They called forward Lisa and one of the New Orleans victims as witnesses, who both pointed Michael Lee Jones out as their attacker. The prosecution argued that their cases showed, quote, a common plan, scheme, or design that had been as much Michael Lee Jones's signature as any DNA evidence. As it turned out, the victim from New Orleans had been a very effective witness. She demonstrated her clear memory and provided statements filled with the same outrage that she had felt six years prior when it had happened. Lisa, on the other hand, had a terrible time on the stand. Michael Lee Jones's lawyers had made fun of the multiple versions of her stories and it seems her lack of English skills only made things worse. Michael Lee Jones pleaded not guilty to all the charges brought against him. He argued through his lawyers, it must be noted that he didn't actually testify himself on the stand, that the sex had all been consensual that the victim had been a sex worker. But the jury in Colorado Springs didn't buy his story, not like the jury in Florida who kind of bought into it. There had been no evidence that the victims had been sex workers, and the DNA evidence was damning. Now, as a result, after just a handful of hours deliberating, the jury found Michael Lee Jones guilty for the attack on victim one, and was subsequently sentenced to an additional 24 years to life in prison. But this case doesn't stop there. 
On Friday the 27th of March 2015, Michael Lee Jones was brought to court in New Orleans on two counts of forcible rape that had occurred in 2003. Michael, who had been 42 years old at the time, pleaded guilty to both counts and was subsequently sentenced to 40 years in prison for an attack that happened in May of 2003 and five years in prison for an attack that happened in June of 2003 with both sentences to be served consecutively. The state has estimated that Michael E. Jones' prison term will last until the day he dies. Lisa, following the lawsuit filed against the Airport Regency Hotel and their security company, ended up winning 300,000 US dollars as a settlement. To this day, Ken Brennan is certain that more DNA matches will be made and more cases will see justice served. And that's everything that I have for you in today's video. Make sure to subscribe to this channel and hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time I post a brand new true crime video just like this one. A special thank you to June's Journey for sponsoring this video. We use the link below to download June's Journey for free. And with all that being said, I'll see you in the next case.